Good evening and welcome to the Kidney Warriors Foundation. Today on the Warrior Journal episode 11, we have with us Dr. Arvind Kanchi, who not only is a nephrologist, but he's also a transplant physician. He, of course, did his MBBS in Chennai. And after that, I mean, sorry, his MBBS in Mysore and his PG in Chennai, where he also got a scholarship to go and do nephrology at the Hammersmith Hospital, London. But the most amazing part of his achievements would be that if you follow him on Twitter, you would see that there is part of his description, percussionist. Yes, our doctor also plays the Mridanga. So obviously, he's a very, very happy man because music makes everything wonderful. Hi, sir. Welcome to the Kidney Warriors Foundation. Thank you, Anjali, for that uh, lovely introduction. Uh, we'll move on to sharing my screen. And I'll request Marianne to enable participant screen sharing. There's a host disabled screen sharing at present. Yes, it's, it's an enabled now, sir. You've, you've enabled? Okay, good. Dr. Kanchi will be talking to, your, to us about protein urea and, of course, answering all the questions that we have been given. Thanks again. So we'll start with the proteinuria and discuss just a bit about it. I'll try to keep it simple and uh, let's see how this goes. So proteinuria simply means the presence of protein in the urine. Obviously, we all pass a small amount of uh, protein in our urine. 150, up to 150 milligrams per 24 hours is normal. In children, it's 140 per meter squared. Transient proteinuria can occur after vigorous exercise, febrile illnesses, and in heart failure. Postural proteinuria, as you change your posture, especially happens in young people, and basically can actually disappear. And this can be excluded in an early morning specimen. Postural proteinuria is actually completely benign. And you see all these... Uh, classifications of proteinuria that you can see, transient proteinuria that we just discussed, fever, heavy exercise, albumin infusion, and so on and so forth. Persistent proteinuria can be orthostatic, uncommon over the age of 30, may occur in 2 to 5% of adolescents. So you need to be careful when you see proteinuria in adolescent. Make sure it's not orthostatic or postural. Overflow protein, proteinuria can also be persistent, and this can happen with patients who have myeloma, rhabdomyolysis, that is muscle breakdown, and so on. Glomerular proteinuria is the commonest form of uh, protein in the urine that we see, and we will come to some of these primary glomerular diseases, diabetic kidney disease, hypertension, and kidney disease, and so on. Tubular interstitial proteinuria is the tubular interstitial or the interstitium, which is the support structure of the kidney. Uh, this proteinuria is usually less than a gram and can happen with the interstitial inflammation, heavy metal toxic toxins, and medication-induced problems. Post-renal, as in urinary tract infections, kidney stones, and tumors are much less common. Symptoms and signs, and the first statement is the most important. In a majority of patients, especially in patients who have diabetes and diabetic kidney disease, there are no symptoms. Hence the need for screening. Obviously, when proteinuria happens uh, in an excessive manner called nephrotic syndrome, you will get symptoms such as frothy urine, leg swelling, swelling around the eyes or periorbital swelling, and high blood pressure. Dipstick is a way of uh, measuring protein in the urine. And this is in the form of uh, a measurement where it is very simple and can be done in remote places that don't have labs. Very important to know that dipstick <coughs> doesn't measure microalbuminuria. That is urine in the range of 300 30 to 300 milligrams per day. And even if the dipstick is positive, the urine dipstick, 
this is a semi quantitative measurement and reported as trace 1 plus 2 plus and so on and sometimes not very reliable for example a dilute urine can underestimate the amount of albumin in the urine and a concentrated urine may actually register as 3 plus but may not actually be indicative of a high grade albumin in the urine hmm. also remember that when you do dipstick examination the amount of time that you need to uh, basically keep the keep the urine on the dipstick and for protein you should read the dipstick after 60 seconds on the right column you can see potential false findings that we probably will not go into what about this measure of urine albumin versus urine protein measuring both concentrations as in the albumin and the total protein can help determine the type of protein urea. urine albumin or albuminuria is usually of glomerular origin glomerulus is the filter of the kidney and any protein coming from there is usually albuminuria proteinuria on the other hand includes albuminuria as well as tubular protein protein that comes from the tubules of the kidney or protein that comes from overflow of light chain disease for example in myeloma which is better is the albumin creatinine ratio called acr or protein creatinine ratio called pcr perhaps urine acr or albumin creatinine ratio is more accurate especially at lower levels of protein output however when urine albumin excretion is greater than 300 than 30 milligrams per millimole of creatinine roughly equivalent to more than 300 milligrams of protein per day it is then acceptable to measure urinary protein creatinine ratio because at this range of uh, let us say high protein excretion in the urine pcr is accurate and considerably cheaper what about a negative urine dipstick along with an elevated urine protein creatinine ratio and we've talked about it just now urine dis dipstick measures albumin in the urine and not to non-albumin protein so if you get overflow proteinuria in the form of light chains as is seen in multiple myeloma you will see a urine protein creatinine ratio that will be very high but the urine albumin creatinine ratio may be low or normal how do you screen for protein or albumin in the urine three methods measurement of the albumin to creatinine ratio or acr in a random spot collection usually in the morning a second type of collection is the 24 hour collection of urine this is basically the gold standard of urine collection you can also have a timed urine collection that could be a four hours duration or an overnight timed collection how do you do a 24 hour urine collection you wake up on the day you plan to start collecting empty your urinary bladder into the toilet as normal and from that point on collect all urine that is passed into the container provided the following morning you should pass the first urine of the day into the container and then stop collecting that forms a 24 hour collection obviously 24 hour collection is very cumbersome and sometimes uh, the collection doesn't happen properly uh, because the patient forgets for this reason we do a spot urine albumin creatinine ratio or a spot urine protein creatinine ratio to estimate the amount of protein excretion in the urine and as you can see here protein creatinine ratio roughly correlates as you can see the line the diagonal line that is drawn here protein measurements roughly correlates with the 24 hour urine collection of course there are situations where the protein creatinine ratio may well not be accurate here in this particular uh, collection 
you find that the protein level uh, of two grams up to eight grams is a sort of a wide range that is, uh, you know, uh, that can vitiate your results. But generally speaking, as you can see the red dots hugging the line, uh, the urine protein creatinine ratio is generally accurate and goes with the 24 hour urine protein levels. Now, we used to call proteinuria, we used to put them into categories such as microalbuminuria and macroalbuminuria. Microalbuminuria is 30 to 300 milligrams of albumin per day. Macroalbuminuria is greater than 300 milligrams of albumin in the urine per day. However, this terminology of microalbumin has now been changed to moderately increased albuminuria and macroalbuminuria has been changed to severely increased albuminuria. We'll come to why the terminology has happened. Basically, when you talk about microalbuminuria, you literally, you literally get the feeling that very small amounts of albumin are actually being excreted in the urine. But this amount of urine that is excreted, this amount of albumin that is excreted in the urine is very important, especially in patients with diabetes, because this can be the earliest sign of diabetic nephropathy. This can also suggest endothelial damage in non-diabetic patients. So renaming this proteinuria as moderately increased or severely increased gives it more importance than the term microalbumin. However, I do find that in labs, microalbuminuria is still used and the new terminology, while it is there in the literature, is not commonly used in our labs. What about nephrotic syndrome? Well, nephrotic syndrome, as you know, is a syndrome where there is leg swelling, generalized edema or leg swelling, proteinuria of 3.5 grams per day. How much is 3.5 grams per day? We were talking about microalbuminuria, which is 30 to 300 milligrams. 3.5 grams is 3,500 milligrams per day. So it is a hugely excessive amount of proteinuria that happens. Along with this, you get generalized edema, which is leg swelling. You get swelling around the eyes. You get hypoalbuminemia, which is a low albumin level in the blood. Normal albumin level is 3.5 to 4.5, whereas the protein, uh, the albumin level in the blood can go down to 2.5 to 1.5 and so on in nephrotic syndrome. We also get hyperlipidemia cholesterol levels can be very high in this syndrome. Let's go to the most common causes of proteinuria. And the two most common sort of entities we see as diseases are diabetic kidney disease or diabetic nephropathy and glomerulonephritis or in short nephritis, which is basically a kidney disease by itself. There are other causes of proteinuria, drugs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, commonly called painkillers like brufen and others can cause proteinuria. Other rarer causes, gold, lithium, heroin, penicillin, infections like hepatitis, HIV virus, for that matter, the COVID-19 virus, that is the recent pandemic that's going on, can also cause an increased level of protein in the urine. Various types of cancer in various places can cause protein in the urine or proteinuria. Myeloma and amyloidosis are other two causes of proteinuria. What are the most common causes of nephritis or glomerulonephritis that cause protein excretion in the urine? Post-infective glomerulonephritis as a result of infection. It's now called IRGN or infection-related glomerulonephritis. The other causes include lupus nephritis, 
minimal change disease that is quite common in children, IgA nephropathy, which is a disease process that is difficult to treat, FSGS, membranous nephropathy, and MPGN, also a difficult illness to treat. So if you look at this wide range of causes for proteinuria, you will understand that when a nephrologist looks at protein in the urine, he starts thinking of all these causes of protein in the urine. But if a patient is diabetic, he hones in on the possibility of diabetic kidney disease. He hones in on the possibility of nephritis within the kidney by doing a kidney biopsy and finding out exactly what is happening. So these are pointers to what the specialist will do after finding protein in the urine. We will also look at the age of the patient when we look at the amount of protein that is being excreted in the urine. You can see here that membranous nephropathy can happen through all agents, but peaks between 45 and 60 years of age. Focal segmental glomerulosclerosis is also a disease that causes proteinuria at any age. But commonly, as you can see the peak here, commonly between the ages of 35 to 55. Minimal change glomerulonephritis, quite frankly, is very common in kids with nephrotic syndrome, also seen in adults, and this is usually diagnosed by a biopsy. Proliferative glomerulonephritis is something that we find with uh, post-infective or infection-related glomerulonephritis. We also see it in lupus nephritis, and this is throughout, they're quite common in the early age group between 15 to 35 years, and then becomes less and less common as the age advances. Diabetic glomerulosclerosis, more common after the age of 35 and becomes more common when you're between 45 or 65 or 70 years old. Amyloidosis, is more of a middle age and elderly population between 45 and 70 years of age and so on. So when you look at the age, you can make up a sort of a diagnosis in your mind when a patient comes to you with proteinuria. Now, why is proteinuria important? Proteinuria is important because it predicts the risk of kidney failure in the future. It is the earliest sign that the kidney shows that kidney failure can develop in the future. So it is a very important symptom or sign that the kidney specialist will look at and decide what to do next. It's not just kidney failure that proteinuria predicts. Proteinuria can also predict the risk of cardiovascular events, especially strokes and heart attacks. Let's look at diabetics with proteinuria, for example. Whether the patient has type 1 or type 2 diabetes, if you look at the number of years of onset of proteinuria on the x-axis, look at the numbers going from 1 through to 5 years after onset of proteinuria. So years after the onset, if you're at 5 years of the onset of proteinuria, you find that the prevalence of renal failure, the percentage of renal failure is roughly about 60%. So if you develop proteinuria five years ago, at five years after you start having proteinuria, there is a good chance that you will have kidney failure of about 55 to 60%. So it's important for us to tackle this early at this stage, zero to one year. That is why we want all patients who have proteinuria to present to us early. The earlier you present, the earlier you screen for proteinuria, the earlier we can treat the disease and get that disease under control and not allow it to progress along this line where it goes from 20 to 60% in a jiffy. Four years is not a long time and developing kidney failure is not a good thing. Proteinuria also predicts stroke and coronary heart disease events, CHD. So if you look at these lines and the graphs here, you find 
the blue line indicates or the blue bar indicates a protein of less than 150 milligrams which is almost normal a urine protein of 150 to 300 which is microalbumin the yellow line or the yellow bar and the red bar you find is the protein that is macroalbuminuria or severely increased proteinuria this yellow bar or the the red bar or the red line so you see what about the survival curves of cardiovascular mortality the person who has more than 300 milligrams of protein in the urine you find that the survival curve is very low the chances of survival become very slim as you move up to 100 months that is about 7 to 8 years down the line your mortality is very high let us look at these bars of stroke and coronary heart disease events you look at the yellow bar which is microalbuminuria you have almost a double the chance of stroke if you have diabetes and microalbuminuria you have a 10% chance as opposed to a 5% chance than if you did not have proteinuria of having stroke Suppose you have macroalbuminuria, which is 300 milligrams or more of protein in the urine. Your risk of developing a stroke is about 22%. Whereas if you don't have protein in the urine, your risk of developing a stroke is 6%. So there's a 16% increase. Look at coronary artery disease or coronary heart disease events. They also increase as your proteinuria increases. That is why it's important for us to control the protein in the urine. So the risk stratification has been done by the KDGO. KDGO is an organization that, that has created this table. And if you look at this table, you're looking at the GFRs greater than 90 being normal. And then you find the staging of kidney failure, G2, G3A, G3B, G4, and G5 kidney failure, which is the most severe form of kidney failure of less than 15 GFR. Now, when you increase the protein, when you add the protein excretion to this usual scale of stage one, two, three, four, five, uh, kidney failure or uh, chronic kidney disease, you are looking at A1 being normal protein, A2 being microalbumin and A3 being macroalbumin. And you can see here the red bars indicate a very high risk. The orange bars indicate a high risk and the moderately increased risk are the yellow bars. So you see, if you not only have a lower GFR, but you also have microalbumin or macroalbuminuria, then your risk of developing kidney failure, worsening kidney failure, risk of strokes, risk of heart attacks, the risk is very high indeed. There was a study called the MDRD. I'm not going to go into much detail. Let me just tell you that they looked at the pro baseline proteinuria and how does the GFR decline or how does kidney failure develop. So they took three groups. The first group is the green line that had less than one gram of proteinuria per day. The yellow line group, which is one to three grams of proteinuria per day. And the red line group, which is three grams of proteinuria or greater than three grams of proteinuria. So you find normally after the age of 40, your GFR reduces by one mil per year, one ml per year, which is a slow decay of kidney function with time. This is going to happen to everybody. But if you have proteinuria along with that, your kidney will decay at the rate of two to three ml per day per year. Whereas if you have a baseline proteinuria of one to three grams, you have a four to six ml deterioration per year. And if you go to a greater than three grams of proteinuria, you have an eight to 10 ml of uh, GFR change per year. So if your GFR is 100, it will fall within three years to 70 if you have three grams of proteinuria. And therefore, you can develop end-stage kidney failure if you have three grams of proteinuria. Within seven years, you will develop end-stage kidney failure. If you're 45 years old and you have three grams of protein in your urine, you'll develop 
end stage kidney failure requiring dialysis by 52 years of age this is why treating proteinuria is very important and i'll come to the last section of my talk uh, which is treatment of proteinuria how do you treat it in diabetics treatment basically involves diet modification sugar control or glycemic control blood pressure control and lipid control and these are very important for diabetics for to control all these uh, entities the common drugs that we use and i'm really not going to go into the detail on this are ace inhibitors you may know the common names like captopril enalapril ramipril and so on or the arbs the angiotensin receptor blockers which are losartan telmisartan olmisartan and azilsartan and and uh, some more like that but these are the common ones now these were the two drugs that we have been using for more than 20 years now the newer drug is the sglt2 inhibitor this has come up in a very big way in the past two years canagliflozin dapagliflozin ampagliflozin are the three very commonly used there are others as well and not only does this reduce proteinuria it helps keep the gfr stable and it prevents kidney failure when it is added to ace inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers so you see this is a new class of drugs that is extremely helpful both to reduce the rate at which the kidney failure worsens and it also helps the heart trials that show ace and arb efficacy i'm not going to go into the detail but type 1 diabetes on the left type 2 diabetes on the right and there have been a lot of trials that show both ace inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers are very very important drugs that you can use to help retard the progression of kidney disease sglt2 inhibitors and i just talked about it uh, now uh, there are various trials the one important trial was the credence trial that came out in the world congress of nephrology in melbourne in april 2019 it showed a tremendous improvement in egfr and equally good heart protection that this drug gave to patients who had diabetes and cardiac disease as well as kidney disease other drugs including the Uh, dapagliflozin and empagliflozin have been looked at in these trials the dapa hf declare timi as well as empareg and emperor reduced uh, trials that have shown much importance of these drugs in uh, diabetic kidney disease dapa ckd just came out very recently i think a couple of weeks ago and this trial showed that even in patients who did not have diabetes this drug dapagliflozin is very important in reducing the decline in kidney function so if you look at this line drawn in the center anything beyond this line means worsening kidney failure anything before this line means you are protecting the kidney and you see worsening kidney function and end stage kidney failure is reduced by all these drugs if you see the straight line here it is reduced by a good deal by how much by about 34% in certain cases 13 to to uh, 12 to 13% in others so this is remember these drugs have been used in association in those who have already been on ace inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers so this is a new group of drugs that are upcoming and will be used more and more in the days to come treatment of glomerulonephritis quite frankly it involves all these drugs prednisolone tacrolimus cyclosporin mycophen led mofetil cyclophosphamide rituximab i am not going to go into the nitty gritty of treatment of glomerulonephritis basically because each disease process has a particular treatment and this is a separate talk in itself final slide suppose as a patient i have diabetes high blood pressure or glomerulonephritis what should i do know your disease some of these diseases are lifelong they will stay with you you need to manage it best yourself find a doctor who will help you manage it 
the doctor will not manage the disease that is my suggestion you as a patient have has to manage this disease with the help of your doctor know your medications you have to know what medications you are taking what doses you are taking don't come to the doctor without your old prescription and say i am taking a blue pill a red pill and the white pill at night that's not going to help us either bring your prescription or bring your pills don't remove your pills from their sheet and then bring the blue or red pill with you that's not going to help us either there are plenty of blue pills with different names bring the sheet or bring a prescription with you you go to the bank you take your checkbook and passbook to know the health of your economic status but you come to the hospital without your previous care sheet or pr prescription where the, those two are your health passbook your health book so that is most important that you preserve it and bring it know your lab tests you should know what your recent blood sugar values are you should know what your bp readings are you should yourself know what your sugar target should be you should know what your bp target should be bp targets let me give you a rough idea 13080 for a diabetic is your blood pressure target 14090 for a person who does not have diabetes or probably has only high blood pressure but these are two targets that should be etched in your mind make sure you know your serum creatinine level make sure you know that you check your urine protein from time to time also visit your doctor for regular follow up even if you are feeling well because there are some tests that he needs to do to make sure that your kidneys are working properly thank you we will move to a question and answer session i suspect thank you all thank you doctor that was truly a lovely way of describing what proteinuria is and everybody who has been hearing this can actually understand what they need to look out for of course i would like to highlight one thing which is very important to all kidney patients and in fact all patients across the world no matter what your disease is always know your labs and medicines and have it preserved in a file because that's your fast book to good health isn't it doctor absolutely yes so sir we start with the first question of the evening and it is i have protein urea night now i would like to know if i do a kidney transplant will my protein urea be controlled also i also have amyloidosis will it affect my new kidney so amyloidosis is a, a disease that uh, usually comes up when there is a cause for it the cause for it could be what is called light chain disease that can cause amyloidosis it could also be a chronic disease process such as rheumatoid arthritis inflammatory bowel disease and so on and so forth this leads to amyloidosis and causes nephrotic range proteinuria that we just discussed and kidney failure if the question is proteinuria is there alone without kidney failure you don't need a kidney transplant you need to get your disease treated the disease process like i said maybe a chronic inflammatory disease that can be treated with medications it could be a light chain overflow proteinuria that can also be treated with medications if the cause is treated sometimes the proteinuria disappears on the other hand if you are a patient who has proteinuria as a result of amyloidosis that is worsening with time and you have kidney failure in addition that is also worsening with time then kidney transplantation is definitely an option dialysis is definitely an option yes uh, amyloidosis can recur in patients who have had a kidney transplant it can recur in up to about 20 to 30% of cases uh, it is manageable uh, as far as case reports go it is manageable with drugs so kidney transplants is a form of treatment but the better form of treatment would be to treat the amyloidosis initially when you diagnose it thank you our next question is after transplant my 24 hour urine protein was raised by 0.750 i want to know how to control it so basically uh, the amount of protein that is coming out in the urine is 750 mg per day this indicates that there is uh macroalbuminuria or as the newer terminology goes severely increased proteinuria now 
what we need to distinguish and it is usually tough to do so is whether this protein is coming from the native kidneys the two kidneys that have been diseased and gone into dysfunction or whether this protein is coming from the transplant kidney that's always a difficult decision and a difficult uh, uh, sort of clinical uh, situation and very difficult for the kidney specialist to discern where it is coming from the only way we can is by doing a transplant kidney biopsy on the other hand 750 mg of proteinuria is not high enough for some of us to consider doing a kidney biopsy so we start patients on medications to try to reduce the protein some of these medications that we talked about in uh, the session just now including as and arbs can be used in transplant situation as well as long as we keep a watch on the creatinine levels and look at whether that reduces the protein if despite the use of medications the protein level increases or the creatinine level increases then we would do a transplant kidney biopsy to look at what the disease process is and then treat it accordingly okay is there any advanced treatment for mpgn i had two kidney transplants on both occasions the kidney was rejected due to recurrence of disease is it good to try for a third transplant is there any way to avoid the possibility of another recurrence of mpgn so this is basically a question about mpgn uh, it's a personal question a difficult question to answer uh, mpgn is a difficult uh, disease to treat quite frankly uh, mpgn uh, there are more and more advances being made in mpgn uh, people are categorize it categorizing it into c3 related glomerulopathy dense deposit disease and so on where some of these diseases when there is a rapidly worsening kidney failure uh, we treat with the immunosuppressive medicines in the form of uh, prednisolone in the form of mycophenolate mofetil some of the newer treatments are people are categorizing categorizing it into there is a feedback from somebody dense deposit disease and so on yes sir i am hearing a feedback of my own voice which is an echo someone has to mute his uh, okay that's fine uh, now so the newer drug that is available is eculizumab which is uh, quite frankly extremely costly and not available to the common man uh, whether this can be used whether uh, the uh, commoner forms of immunosuppression in the form of uh, uh, let us say uh, steroids or prednisolone and mycophenolate mofetil can be used this will depend on the disease process causing mpgn and is best left to the uh, nephrologist who is treating that patient okay there's protein leak in urine that needs advice on how to control it it's 1.3 at present so this patient has 1.3 the protein creatinine ratio that usually means that it is 1300 mg of proteinuria per day this is in the range of macroalbuminuria or severely increased proteinuria the newer terminology yes. if the patient has diabetes or high blood pressure then importantly treating diabetes adequate glycemic control also consider adequate blood pressure control the use of the the drugs that i just said ace inhibitors angiotensin receptor blockers are the two common drugs that we tend to use and in addition we also at this point in time would consider using sglt2 inhibitors to try to treat this uh, proteinuria as long as the proteinuria is not uh, a result of uh, let us say glomerular disease which is nephritis in such a situation if the patient is not a diabetic then we would do a kidney biopsy to look at why the patient has protein in the urine and looking at what the biopsy says then we treat that disease process accurately okay i have been an fsgs ckd patient for the last 6 years and my creatinine always fluctuates between 1.7 to 2.40 protein in urine fluctuates from nil to plus 3 rbc fluctuates from nil to 
100 to 120 HP. How can I control these parameters? So this is a difficult situation to be in. Basically, this patient has glomerulonephritis or FSGS, which is focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. This is a kidney disease that causes high blood pressure and protein loss in the urine. When this happens, we usually obviously do a kidney biopsy first to diagnose the disease and the extent of chronicity or the extent of the disease process within the kidney and then go on to treat this patient with various drugs, depending on the level of proteinuria and the creatinine, we would probably treat it with medications such as uh, steroids, that is prednisolone. We would treat it with MMF or mycophenolate mofetil or uh, treat it with, uh, uh, with other medications called calcineurin inhibitors to try to reduce the amount of protein in the urine. It's always difficult when the patient develops chronic kidney disease or CKD, where the creatinine now is about two. At this point in time, you're looking at CKD treatment. And in such situations, we then say, we treat the hypertension and we try to reduce the protein in the urine and keep a watch out for complications. So, sir, this is a question that has come by many people, and I think it's a common question. I'm sure you face it all the time. My protein in urine is shown as plus, a single plus. Do nightshades, wheat contributes to this proteinuria, and we want to have the clarification for this. So, uh, wheat does not contribute to protein in the urine. I, do, I don't think so at all, and there is, there is no literature whatsoever. None of the, uh, let us say, a protein, vegetarian protein that is used uh, cause any harm to the kidney. All types of dals that we give, I do not restrict dals in my patient. I do not restrict wheat. Nightshades, can you tell me what exactly that is? Nightshades are different colored, darker vegetables, basically. Okay, no, I don't think vegetables have any effect on uh, protein in the urine. Now, when you talk about uh, trace, one plus, two plus protein, uh, these are semi-quantitative measures of protein okay. where you are looking at a dipstick or a urine routine examination that gives you a semi-quantitative estimation. Trace is perhaps about 150, 1 plus corresponds to 300 milligrams, uh, three, 2 plus corresponds to between 300 and 800, three, 4 plus corresponds to more than uh, uh, 3 grams of protein. But quite frankly, uh, you would want to do a urine protein creatinine ratio, which is basically to try to quantitate the protein in the urine. The best method is 24 hour urine, very difficult to collect. The next best is a urine protein creatinine ratio that will give you the exact estimation of the amount of protein that you've lost in the urine. And taking that into account, you will then treat with medications depending on whether this is nephritis or diabetic kidney disease or something else. Uh, wheat does not cause protein loss in the urine. Dal does not cause protein loss in the urine. Vegetables don't cause protein loss in the urine. Uh, the next question has actually already been answered by the previous one, which is I want to know which is the most reliable test to confirm the exact protein albumin levels in the urine. So the exact test and the gold standard is a 24 hour urine collection. And I already alluded to that. How to collect 24 hours is also something I have talked. You can go back to rewind the talk and have a look at how 24 hour collection is done. A bit cumbersome, it can be done, however. Yes, and as Sir said, it's a very easy process. It's there on this video. So at the end of it, you could go back always and check it out. We now go on to the next question, which is, is it possible to have protein, have high protein in urine when your BP is normal or have protein in your urine when BP is normal? Yes, it is possible to have uh, proteinuria without hypertension. Some of the glomerular diseases like minimal change disease, some of the diseases like IgA nephropathy, these are diseases that can come up during adolescence or in patients who are in their second, third or fourth decade. These are patients who can develop this disease without high blood pressure. The only way you can get to know that the disease is there is by having a, a syndrome called nephrotic syndrome where the patient has uh, puffiness around the eyes or swelling in the legs or frothy urine and the patient comes to you 
you screen the urine and find out that the patient has a lot of protein in the urine and this is treatable with drugs. All these patients, at least most of them, may not have high blood pressure. Okay. Also, some diabetics for that matter may not have high blood pressure and may have protein in the urine. I'm facing a problem with having creatinine protein ratio at 0.31 and also all protein at 57.3. Is there any risk to the transplanted kidney? I'm not able to contact the doctor due to COVID. So this uh, amount of protein, which is about 0.31, is about 310 milligrams, which is not a high degree of protein in the urine, but it is a degree of protein in the urine that should involve some thought process uh, on where it is coming from. Again, in a transplanted patient, we are always uh, in a bit of a bind considering whether this protein is coming from the native kidneys in case there was some urine output from those kidneys uh, in this patient, or is it coming from the transplanted kidney itself? Like I said, I would look at the blood pressure of this patient, control it. Sometimes blood pressure control itself will reduce the protein in the urine. Think about drugs that could help reduce the protein in the urine. Start this patient on those drugs and see whether the protein reduces. If the protein continues to increase and go above a gram, two grams, then a situation arises where you would want to do a transplant kidney biopsy to decide whether a separate treatment for the disease process is needed. On the other hand, quite frankly, 0.31 is not uh, is not a medical emergency. So whenever you are able to contact your doctor after or a month or so, you can do that. Most of the specialists are now available by online consults and video consults. And this is something that you can choose as an option to try to get to your doctor and see whether he can uh, uh, guide you on what to do and calm your nerves. All right. Now, another question which has come to my mind and to many people often is that when we are talking about a, pre, a protein loss, we automatically think about replacing the protein. But similar, at the same time, we're told we're not supposed to have large amounts of protein. So it's very confusing because you're talking about a loss, you want to balance it, and then you're, tall, you're told basically not to add protein to your diet. So how does one really figure this out? So this is a, a difficult question to answer. And the first uh, answer that I would give is uh, from the literature that we have, we know that vegetarian protein is not harmful to the kidney. Restricting dals and vegetarian protein is out of the question. Whether the patient has advanced kidney failure, mild kidney failure, moderate kidney failure, I at no point in time advise patients to take less dal in their diet. Vegetarian protein does not cause a problem. Let's now come to non-vegetarian protein. Non-veg protein, quite frankly, and most of the literature has come from the US and Western European nations, where you are looking at having a meat intake three times a day. In India, non-vegetarians may not eat meat all the time. Yes. This basically non-vegetarians perhaps take meat twice a week, or once a week, or thrice a week. So the, the amount of non-vegetarian food that is going in, you're basically looking at kidneys that have to work more to process protein food. Okay. Veg protein at one gram per kg per day. So if you're 60 kgs, if you take 60 grams of protein, vegetarian protein, that's not going to harm your kidneys. I'm only talking about patients who have kidney diseases. I am not talking about patients who are normal. They can eat veg, non-veg, any come what may, but obviously in moderation. Moderation in life in any um, yes. thing is important. Uh, now, as far as non-veg protein goes, I do restrict non-veg protein in some of my uh, patients who have kidney dysfunction, kidney failure, because in, in these situations, giving non-veg protein or normal or high protein or protein intake of more than a gram per kg body weight per day can actually make the kidney work a bit more to process those proteins and that can then mean that this patient will have problems with worsening glomerular filtration rates, GFR, which is the 
kidney number that you go by okay quite frankly therefore i would restrict only non veg protein in these patients vegetarian proteins i would still allow there comes a, a disease process where patients have nephrotic syndrome and i actually losing protein of about 3 to 5 to 8 grams per day in this situation i will still allow a normal protein intake especially vegetarian protein so sir another question is again i've been asked this and it's also i've thought about it a many a many times so there isn't a direct connection of protein loss and putting that protein back into your body not necessarily the protein intake should be fair enough uh, for nutrition to be maintained hmm. there are many who advocate a low protein diet to reduce the decline in kidney function Okay. these are called low protein diets and very low protein diets mm -hmm. there are many uh, abroad there are many in india who advocate these diets uh, i am quite frankly not a big advocate of this diet because in india i think already the protein intake compared to the west is lower for example an average american has a protein intake of 1.3 to 1.5 grams of protein per kg body weight per day so if he's okay. 60 kgs wow. he's taking between 60 to 90 grams of protein per day in india vegetarians take between 0.8 to 0.9 grams of protein per day per kg body weight per day so a 60 kg vegetarian in india will be taking about 50 to 55 grams of protein per day so you are now looking at trying to restrict that protein and there are people who advise protein restriction as in vlpd very low protein diets lpd low protein diets where they want to bring this protein down to 0.6 grams per kg per day or even 0.4 which is very low protein in the diet and supplement it with keto acids and so on That's this right. is not something that i do i have a different take on this i have a different opinion i do not advise vegetarian protein restriction in my patients with ckd so before i go on to the next question could i please uh, request you to stop the screen sharing of your pdf and your yeah thank you sir all right now we move on to one of the questions that's come on because we've actually gone live on fb and uh, there are two three questions which are pertaining of course to protein urea all of you listening to us i would like to draw your attention about that this entire web journal is about protein urea so all your other questions will be answered but we'll tackle this first in this session so Ittifaq Mansouri says after 5 years of transplant my 24 hours urine protein has raised point to 0.825 and it is not being controlled by ACE inhibitors creatinine is 1.1 and my doctor is not suggesting a renal biopsy for me what is your opinion so basically this uh, is something that uh, every nephrologist has a personal opinion on how to treat patients and i would stick by your nephrologist if your nephrologist feels a biopsy is not necessary then he has a good reason to say so partly because 800 mg mg of protein is definitely above normal but and i've said this twice in my talk already we need to make sure that this is coming from the transplant kidney not coming from your native kidneys if your native kidneys have had even a bit of urine output before you were transplanted then we are always in two minds about biopsying a transplant kidney that is doing nothing much not creating not causing much harm if the protein levels are increasing with time 800 mg goes to a gram goes to 1.2 1.5 then i would consider doing a biopsy if the creatinine level is increasing with time creatinine of 1.1 is going to 1.2 1.4 i would consider doing a biopsy so each nephrologist has his own way of thinking about a particular issue and trying to treat it i am sure your nephrologist is uh, you are in good hands and whatever he is doing is 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 the best for your transplant kidney uh, yes you can probably add medications you can increase the dose of ace inhibitors for example add other medications to try to reduce protein and so on that is something that i would do now i have told you that 
urine protein is also a risk factor for cardiovascular disease and strokes. So if you do have high protein in your urine, I would look to make sure on a yearly basis, and you may already have done so, check out your heart with the cardiologist and make sure your heart function is fine and keep a watch on the protein from time to time, which I'm sure your nephrologist will, and take that decision, the nephrologist will, of whether a kidney biopsy is needed or not. Okay. So we have a next question, which I'm going to link up with a couple of them because some are live and some are what we have got earlier, which I've shared with you. So Amit Shah asks, what could be the first signs of proteinuria? And then I go on to the second part of a question, which has been asked earlier. My daughter has high BP and traces of protein in her urine. Is this a sign of any kidney-related problem? I, too, am a transplanted patient. So please guide us. So there are three questions here. The first question is, uh, what was that? Uh, what signs the of sign? proteinuria. Yeah. There are absolutely, and this is a statement I've already made in one of the slides that uh, was not live streamed at, the, streamed at that point in time. Patients who have proteinuria may be totally asymptomatic. There may be absolutely no sign as such. So, for example, if you do have a lot of protein in the urine, this is called nephrotic syndrome, then you will have signs. Frotty urine, swelling around your eyes called periorbital edema, swelling in your legs called pedal edema, high blood pressure readings that the doctor may get, are some signs of nephrotic syndrome, which is a high level of protein in the urine. Now, if you have a low level of protein, not a low level, but a level of protein in the urine that is about, let us say, one gram or 1.5 grams of protein in the urine, none of these signs may be present. Proteinuria, therefore, may be silent or asymptomatic. In such a situation, if you are a diabetic and you have protein in the urine, the only way you will get to know is by screening yourself for protein in the urine. Every diabetic at the time of diagnosis should do a urine protein screen. And thereafter, every six months, every type 1 diabetic, because type 1 diabetics are known to be diagnosed earlier than type 2 diabetics. Type 1 diabetic, we allow a time period of three to five years before doing urine protein test. But in India, quite frankly, given the degree of diabetes that we have, I would suggest if you are a diabetic, you will screen your urine for protein, microalbumin in the first place, and then for protein if needed. You will screen your blood creatinine or serum creatinine test at the time of diagnosis of diabetes. And thereafter, every six months to a year, so that you know when the slightest change happens and get it treated properly. So, sir, a commonly asked question, which you have, of course, answered earlier, but because of the live stream advantage, now we can answer it once again. Is proteinuria one of the early signs of failing kidneys? Absolutely. Proteinuria is a sign of three things. One, if there is a high protein level in the urine, even microalbuminuria, which is 30 to 300 milligrams of protein per day in a diabetic, it spells problems in the future. One, it is indicative of the fact that kidney failure will develop in the future unless you get it treated now. Two, proteinuria means even microalbuminuria, and this is especially in diabetic means, that you have a high risk of developing cardiovascular disease, that is strokes and heart attacks. So you will have to screen yourself for heart disease. So if you do have microalbuminuria, proteinuria, you will look for three things, developing kidney failure in the future, developing strokes in the future, developing heart attacks in the future. All this can be prevented by proper sugar control, proper blood pressure control, proper control of kidney disease, whatever that kidney disease may be. Sir, from one of our uh, people coming on on the live stream, Anusia, thank you for your question. What does proteinuria in pregnancy indicate? So this is a completely different topic and proteinuria in pregnancy is an important topic. I did not touch up this at all and Basically, this can be a talk by itself. Proteinuria in 
in pregnancy may be indicative of previous kidney disease if the protein has never been checked before it may be indicative of high blood pressure developing during pregnancy and if high blood pressure develops during pregnancy along with proteinuria you can develop a syndrome called preeclampsia this preeclampsia can then go on to a more serious situation called eclampsia where proteinuria leg swelling high blood pressure during pregnancy is then associated with fits so this is a very dangerous syndrome that can develop in pregnancy and therefore if there is protein in the urine remember in pregnancy it is very difficult to use those drugs that we usually use in patients who have diabetes so all these drugs like ace inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers they are all contraindicated cannot be given during pregnancy so we usually observe the degree of proteinuria we are very loath to do a kidney biopsy we usually don't do it unless there is protein in the urine early in pregnancy we observe for uh, any changes in proteinuria during the pregnancy we also think about giving medications such as steroids if the proteinuria level is very high also we look at considering doing a biopsy after the baby after the fetus is delivered if needed remember once delivery happens and the placenta is removed the placenta is the driver of the hormone based problems during pregnancy it is always likely that the protein levels may well decrease with time so we allow 2 to 6 weeks after pregnancy for the protein levels to decrease tight blood pressure control with medications that we can use during pregnancy like methyl dopa like uh, nifedipine like lobetalol these are drugs that we use for tight blood pressure control and partly that will also help control the blood the protein in the urine but generally speaking some of the drugs that we use for protein control cannot be given in pregnancy so observation and control after delivery biopsy if needed 2 to 6 weeks later if protein urea doesn't reduce are some things that we tend to do in pregnancy thank you dr anusri i hope that answers your question we move on to our next one which is is protein urea Uh, sorry i am a ckd patient stage 3 with 1.5 creatinine and 1.8 grams of protein urea the doctor has prescribed me visolone 30 mg for 2 months with a taper off of 6 uh, for ckd has anyone taken steroid for a short period of time and stayed away after that should i go 30 mg directly or should slowly increase the dosage and i don't understand the taper off part so quite frankly what is happening here is empirical steroid therapy empirical is supposing that and thinking in your own mind that there is a problem going on in the kidney such as glomerulonephritis and making a diagnosis in your own mind that this is a nephritis in the kidney and treating empirically with steroids the better way of treating this patient would be to go in for a kidney biopsy to see why is there a protein uh, loss in the urine to see why is the creatinine 1.5 and then deciding on treatment on the other hand the kidney specialist or nephrologist may already have looked at this the kidney sizes may be small and he may have considered that if the kidney sizes are small that the kidney therefore is not biopsyable if he feels that in in such uh, situations he may give empirical treatment with steroid he may consider treatment with ace inhibitors and arbs to try to reduce the protein and so on so the general gist of this is i cannot answer personal situations because i will not have the full information okay. and it is difficult to to make a decision online during a question session to treat Uh, personal based questions 
Thank you. That's a very important thing. Yes, we're here to answer your questions, but those questions are here just to make you sure of what you're going through. It's not really a line of treatment unless doctor has been able to see you personally or get onto a video call with all your labs and of course all your previous checkups. Now we move on to another question, which is my husband's report shows protein traces in urine. He's suffering from PKD. Any medicine is available to control the protein and is it a cause for weight loss? Polycystic kidney disease is a, a different form of uh, a kidney disease. It is a, a congenital disorder. It is a genetic disorder. And uh, trace protein in the urine, again, is something that we would need to quantify. Quantification of the protein then gives us how much protein is being lost. Kidney disease in the form of various glomerulonephritis, including membranous nephropathy can happen with patients who have polycystic kidney disease. It is rare, but it has been described. On the other hand, trace protein loss can happen even with polycystic kidney disease. In this group of patients, control of blood pressure is the most important and key to treatment. As long as you control blood pressure, not necessarily with ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, even common Calcium channel blockers and other drugs can be used for blood pressure control and that itself will help reduce the protein in the urine. Control of cyst uh, formation or increased cyst formation or cyst enlargement. Uh, there are other medications that can be used called tolvaptan. Uh, drinking plenty of water in a situation where the kidney function is normal may help uh, reduce cyst uh, sizes or at least in, reduce the increase of uh, cyst sizes. So a trace protein in a PKD is something that can be followed up, blood pressure can be controlled and you could watch the protein in the urine. PKD is a situation where you would not want to do a biopsy. Uh, biopsy is tough to do, uh, not impossible but tough to do uh, in patients who have cysts. Again, this is a personal question and until I have more information, very difficult for me to uh, tell you exactly how it is treated. So Renuka Bhargava has also asked a similar question and as doctor has said right now, unless without full evidence of your reports, he can't really tell you exactly. But her question is also, what can be done to prevent muscle loss and constant weight loss? Uh, this is a very general and non-specific question. I am sure the patient initially has... Uh, CKD, chronic kidney disease or protein in the urine and is now facing weight loss and muscle loss, that is a possibility. Now this is known to happen with uh, uh, restrictive diets, uh, low protein diets. So if low protein diets have been going on for some period of time, low protein diets are known to cause uh, weight loss, are known to cause muscle lean we call it lean body mass, and that is known to happen. In fact, just two days ago, uh, we got the results of the timed uh, meal, timed fasting. I think it's called uh, uh, time-related fasting or something like that, where people fast for about 12 hours and only eat eight hours oh, in a day. Intermittent or fasting, in sir. Exactly. So in this, uh, they've just come out with some details which says that this intermittent fasting, while it does cause weight loss, uh, even in the group that were not doing intermittent fasting, the same degree of the control group, the same degree of weight loss was noted. So the principal investigator has come out with uh, evidence which says intermittent uh, fasting may induce weight loss, but really uh, it is almost similar to those who are not uh, doing intermittent weight loss but are following a diet and two some investigators during this diet have found that when you do intermittent fasting part of the weight loss is due to lean body mass reduction that is reduction in your muscle mass and this is related to the fact that either you're fasting for too long a period of time or you're taking less protein come what may again uh, Reduction in weight can be related to diets. It can be related to other things. For example, kidney failure, you lose your appetite. You don't take in enough. You can lose your body weight. You can lose muscle mass. 
uh, other problems like uh, stomach ailments, including uh, ulcers and so on can lead to this sort of a problem. So just weight reduction and reduction in your muscle mass means that you need to go through endoscopies to see what's happening and so on and so forth. Again, this is a situation I can't really put specificities into it. This is a, a general sort of body check that we, we would do as doctors and then go into the specificities depending on what we find on an initial workup. So Dr. Donald Devnani wants to know that his protein urea is plus three and his amyloidosis is caused by the kidney problem. So basically we've discussed amyloidosis already and all I would say is amyloidosis is a tough disease to handle. It can cause nephrotic syndrome that is a lot of protein in the urine. It can cause leg swelling and it can cause uh, problems with uh, the heart. Uh, amyloidosis is usually of two varieties, AL amyloidosis where light chain deposition causes uh, amyloid problems and this is usually generated in the bone marrow in the form of a myeloma or not quite a myeloma but light chain. So we would look at the bone marrow and look at uh, seeing what is causing the amyloidosis. Thank you. A, a amyloidosis is another form and that can come up from chronic inflammatory bubble disease, rheumatoid arthritis, so chronic diseases that are existent in the body. So again, amyloidosis means we need to find the cause for the amyloidosis and treat it. I have some questions which are common questions which I'm sure everybody would be interested in from Ravi Hazuria. And he says, and Ravi, this question has already been answered, so you could rewind this talk. It's got to do with ACE and R, uh, ARB diet for protein urea, including gluten and nightshade vegetables, please. We have already spoken about it. But his next question is, he has, very, he has confirmed with very high leakage of protein levels, and therefore he wants to know how much of protein can be consumed. So this is, uh, again, a difficult question to answer without knowing the background. Diabetics with the high No, protein. he also has a single kidney, sir, since birth. The single kidney with high protein in, uh, in the urine. Uh, as far as uh, restriction, again, I would look at the creatinine level. And depending on whether there is kidney dysfunction or not, treatment would then be tailored to that problem. Uh, Regarding diet and protein restriction in those who have proteinuria, I would not restrict vegetarian protein since I believe that vegetarian protein does not cause kidney damage. I would restrict non vegetarian levels. Uh, just Restricting protein on a whim and a fancy is not something that I do. And again, more details will then uh, make me, you know, I will be in a more comfortable zone to answer this question rather than, uh, you know, the details that I've been given. So again, so he said he's SM diabetic and his creatinine is 3.29. Okay. So if you have chronic kidney disease with uh, diabetes, obviously protein restriction is something that we tend to do but not vegetarian protein. Non-vegetarian protein is something I would restrict. Given the fact that you have uh, proteinuria, you would look at the various drugs that you would use, ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. The newer uh, SGLT2 inhibitors are something that I would use. Get a target BP down to 13080. Get your sugars down to a HbA1c of 7 and take it from there. So, sir, now one more question. Of course, we've, we've answered this before, but we'll ask it again since these people have joined us late. Abhishek Pandey says that uh, renal amyloidosis caused macro, macro, uh, macroalbuminuria in me. I'm under dialysis. Now, if I do undergo transplant, can this particular condition damage my transplanted kidney? So I have answered this question before and the answer is yes. Depending on whether your amyloidosis is AA or AL, some of this can act actually recur. AL amyloidosis is more in the bone marrow and this is something that your uh, specialist, either the hematologist or the nephrologist may already have looked at. Mm -hmm. uh, protein urea can recur after, after transplant, yes. About 20 to 33% of uh, cases, uh, you can develop amyloidosis in your transplanted kidney as well. Uh, however, this can be controlled with medications and there are uh, case reports that show 
uh, given the medications that we have uh, these days, perhaps while recurrence is a problem, can we control the disease to an extent where we can keep the transplant working for some degree of time is something that is being looked at. All right. And Renuka Bhargav wants to know, is it okay to take animal protein? And Rajiv Menon wants to know, does excess protein consumption increase your creatinine? So the second question is a more difficult question to answer. I have uh, many patients who have come to me with the sole uh, clinical feature of a raised creatinine on a background of gymming and taking high protein powders. Now these patients usually consume between 2 to 2.5 grams per kg body weight per day. So they are building muscle mass and as a result of building muscle mass they excrete more creatinine and as a result the serum creatinine can go up. Uh, it is difficult to call this kidney failure because once you get the creatinine, once you get the protein levels down to a gram per kg body weight per day, which is the normal recommended allowance, 1 to 1.2 grams uh, per kg body weight per day, the creatinine tends to come down to normal. So yes, high protein diets may increase the creatinine when you're taking really huge amounts of protein uh, to build muscle mass as in gymming. On the other hand, a normal person who is taking uh, normal amounts of protein with who has normal kidney function, if he takes high protein for a prolonged period of time just by eating, let's say, non-veg food, I don't think that is a cause for kidney failure. That is not going to cause kidney failure. Uh, there is no literature or data yet which says taking high protein diet just because you take non-vegetarian food, uh, not in the context of, let us say, very high, which is more than two grams of protein per kg body weight per day, not in the context of gymming and building muscle mass, just high protein diet should not cause kidney failure in young and healthy adults who have two normally functioning kidneys. Okay. And since we are talking about the amount of protein, uh, Renuka wants to know how much of dairy products can one include in their diet? Dairy products uh, basically, again, will depend on many things. You will have to look at the GFR or the CKD status of the particular patient. You are looking not only at protein, you are also looking at uh, phosphate. The phosphate content of dairy products can be high. The calorie content of dairy products will be high. Some of the cholesterol content or the lipid content of dairy products will be high. So you need to moderate your dairy products. And I've said this before, anything is mo in moderation is good, but you need to be very careful. And this will depend on your CKD staging. If the CKD staging is high, then I will still allow dairy products, but we'll watch your phosphate levels. We'll watch your other blood test levels before deciding on restricting them. In protein urea, one thing is reducing protein intake. Does the lesser consumption of protein impact the pa patient's lifestyle as far as exercise, etc. is concerned in any manner? Yeah, this is something we also talked about in, in detail. Now, uh, protein restriction is advised because chronic kidney failure, when the, when the GFR or the kidney number is lower than normal, the decay of GFR or decay of kidney function can be reduced or halted if you take a low protein diet. That is the basic premise of giving low protein diets. I do not advise low protein vegetarian diets. Vegetarian diets are okay. So I tend to give 0.8 to 1 gram per kg body weight of vegetarian protein in the diet. Non-vegetarian protein is supposed to cause problems, but again, in moderation, in small amounts, I really don't think in early CKD, non-vegetarian protein causes harm either. What was the other part of the question? The other part of the question is, does this impact the patient's lifestyle when it comes to so, do with his exercise, etc.? So basically, if you are looking at low protein diets, you should make sure that you don't fall short of nutrition. You don't go into malnutrition and undernutrition. Most often, low protein diets are about 0 0.6 grams per kg body weight per day, which is quite low. Very low protein diets, you go down to between 0.3 to 0.4 grams per kg body weight per day, which is really very low. And at this level of low protein in your diet, you can develop problems with weight loss, lean body mass levels can go low. 
you can develop problems with undernutrition and malnutrition that you should try to avoid most commonly physicians will try to avoid the malnutrition by giving you other uh, amino acids and so on whether this will help or harm in the long run is a difficult question to answer i am not fond of low protein diets so i am biased against i may not be the best person to ask about low protein diets so sir when we are talking about protein and we are talking about animal protein versus vegetarian protein how much animal protein do you think a person can consume while they consuming vegetarian protein as well so what would your ratio be so i would not put any ratios here because if you are a normal healthy person with healthy kidneys you can eat whatever you want again right. in mod in moderation in right but uh if you are eating uh, vegetarian protein along with non vegetarian protein you can stick to 1 g or 1.2 g per kg body weight of that protein the mix of vegetarian and non vegetarian protein per kg body weight per day so if you are 60 kg you will take between 60 to 70 g of protein per day this is if your kidneys are normal if your kidneys are not normal you may shift to between 50 and 60 g of protein per day vegetarian protein i don't allow non vegetarian protein if there is ckd okay so that answers your question all of you who have been asking can we have animal protein or non vegetarian protein in in this particular situation but, but quite frankly and i need to interrupt you quite frankly the indian non vegetarian diet is not as heavy in non vegetarian food as the as the literature has come from us and western european countries where they take much higher levels of non vegetarian protein so quite frankly i cannot generalize that idea and say restrict non vegetarian protein totally this is a very gray area for me as an individual nephrologist other nephrologist may have it very clear in their mind that they will restrict protein and they are right in their own mind because the literature does point to that i have my own questions on that literature because it's mainly from the west and U- us and uk or western european nations who eat non vegetarian protein in two or three meals per day who have a protein intake of between 1.3 to 1.4 grams per kg body, body weight per day indians non vegetarians may have a, a, a higher protein intake but vegetarians have already a lower protein intake and this has been shown in indian studies that we actually take 0.8 to 0.9 grams per kg body weight per day already and in such situations if you want to restrict protein i am not for it maybe others are okay so what happens to somebody who is a kidney patient with a creatinine of 2.7 their phosphorus levels have reached the nearly the limit how much milk can they drink and can they drink milk at all yeah i would definitely give them milk two glasses of milk per day is not a problem and how much of dal can a, pH, a ckd patient have in this condition of protein urea so dal quite frankly as far as uh, it being a vegetarian protein 1 g per kg body weight per day so if you are 60 kg you can take 60 g of protein per okay. day and uh, is it okay to have you know drinks such as reno pro um, as as a dialysis patient at uh, you know these protein powders is it advisable for them to take it and if so, so how much basically if you are a pre dialysis patient and you come on to dialysis you should increase your protein in your food i would actually increase your protein to 1 to 1.2 grams per kg body weight per day all dialysis patients should take a 60 kg individual should take between 60 to 70 grams of protein per day okay. this can be non vegetarian protein i would advise most of my dialysis patients to take at least 3 to 4 non vegetarian meals per per week even a, a non vegetarian meal per day i will allow as long as it is not a fry i would advise boiled non vegetarian food to be given fish chicken is advisable on a daily basis for dialysis patients because they come through all these protein restriction and are malnourished and their protein levels are low and the single most important indicator of mortality in dialysis patients is their serum albumin level the serum protein or serum albumin level if your albumin level is low mortality rate is high 
So I want to build the protein level to about 3.5 to 4 grams, which is the normal range. And if you want to do that, vegetarian protein is definitely allowed. I already allow it. I will allow egg white. I will allow non-vegetarian food on a daily basis for my dialysis patients. So, sir, now you've just given us some data, which I have understood from your conversation with me today, is that if you're a dialysis patient and you're 60 kilos, you could have between 60 to 70 percent of 60 to 70 percent, 70 grams, to 70 grams, of, grams protein. of protein coming into you. Whereas if you are a CKD patient and you're having this protein leak, you will have 50 to 60 grams. Right. So there is a the discrepancy. This is, uh, I, I mean, each question can be answered differently by different kidney specialists. So each kidney specialist may have to make up his own mind on how much to give and how much not to. If the patient has proteinuria, I don't restrict protein in the diet. I will still give one gram per kg body weight, maybe vegetarian instead of non-vegetarian protein. Again, in CKD patients, I will still give one gram per kg body weight, but only vegetarian protein, non, not non-vegetarian. Okay, thank you. And the last question that we have right now here is my son is 25 years old, has protein traces in his urine. Can this be reversed? I'm also a transplant patient of my own from five years. My urine output is for me, but 24 hours protein reports are normal. To answer the second question, uh, first, for me urine really, does, I mean, yes, for me urine is one sort of sign or symptom of uh, protein in the urine, but all foamy urine doesn't okay. contain protein. So if your 24 hour urine protein is normal, it means the foam is not protein. So don't worry about it. Okay. The second question is more important. If your 25 year old son has trace protein in the urine, we need to find out why. So what I would do is I would check his blood pressure I would also check his sugar levels. Every Indian can become hypertensive or diabetic at any point in time in his life. You need to make sure you screen for that. You will also quantify the protein level either as a 24 hour urine protein or a urine protein creatinine ratio to know the exact amount of protein that is being lost in the urine. And then if we find a problem, we treat it. And we have one more question from Renuka Bhargava, who's joined us live on FB. And it says, is a plant-based diet recommended where one is not taking any dairy products, but lots of vegetables? In that situation, is it okay to take some wheat? Wheat, I'm not sure why wheat is coming into this equation time and again. Quite frankly, wheat in patients who are normal, in patients who have CKD should not cause problems. Plenty of wheat can raise the potassium a bit. Other than that, uh, I, I will not restrict wheat if you have CKD. Again, in moderation, it can be used. Okay. And uh, uh, one more question, which has got to do less with protein urea, but since you're on, I think everyone is so excited to get answers from you, doctor. It says, hi, Anjali, can CKD be halted with BP control and sodium bicarbonate tablets in a non-diabetic patient from creatinine level of around three? And that is from Rahul Sofet. So basically, you're looking at CKD with a creatinine of three. Uh, the GFR is pretty low, should be, uh, depending on the age, should be between 20 and 30. Now, in such a situation, we have set goals. Blood pressure control here will be the most important. We look at targeting blood pressure to about 130, 80 with medications. Salt restriction in patients who are hypertensive to about 4 grams per day. Looking at if the patient is diabetic, we would give drugs to control uh, the protein and these specific drugs would be ACE inhibitors or ARBs and add an SDLT2 inhibitor if that is needed and that is the in thing nowadays and that is something we would use in diabetics. Uh, so blood pressure control, diet control, medications to help uh, reduce the decline in GFR of the kidney and these are the specific medications that we'd use. And these are the things that we would do. Will it halt progression? I'm not so sure. Will it delay the sudden decline? It can delay because as long as you reach targets of sugar control, BP control, 
reduce the protein levels in the urine by giving these drugs, you can delay the progression. You can delay the decline in kidney. The rapid decline in kidney function can be delayed. It probably may not halt it, but in some it does. You can maintain a creatinine of three for more than six months to a year. That in itself can be a victory. And sir, uh, Donald Dev Nani wants to know what is the name of a test or many tests that you would recommend that could be done every month or every forty-five days so they can keep a track of what is happening to their bodies as far as protein urea is concerned. I'm not sure every month or every forty-five days is required. Basically, if you are looking at CKD, you are looking at checking the creatinine and potassium. In advanced CKD, you may want to do it much earlier. Let us say. Uh, much more frequently once a month and so on. So, protein levels, on the other hand, will depend on the particular uh, problem that exists in the patient. If it's a diabetic with proteinuria, we probably would screen for the protein once in three to six months or even once a year, depending on the degree of protein. And a change in treatment will mean that we will look at the protein levels again after change in treatment. So, the frequency of checking. uh tests for protein will depend on the disease process that is going on and a treatment modification that may have happened we usually do not check proteins once a month perhaps once in 3 to 6 months yes uh, we usually do check creatinine and potassium more frequently especially with advancing kidney failure because we want to know how the kidney is uh, doing with time and again of course it's coming back to haunt you the favorite question of this evening is i heard gluten in wheat increases protein urea now quite frankly i'm going to have to go back and read all the literature now to see exactly where this thought process is coming from uh, i i really have nothing to offer here i do not think wheat increases protein in the urine i don't think wheat causes harm to the kidney in advanced kidney failure there are certain situations where taking plenty of wheat may raise the potassium levels and we do look at the potassium levels wheat again is not the most common uh, food we look at for potassium we look more at fruits and the like so quite frankly wheat and kidney failure is not something that uh, is is an association according to me but sir like i would talk to you uh, i mean on sides of these patients and especially all the people who are asking about gluten uh, my brother is a dialysis patient himself sunny and he has a lot of pain in his stomach and of course that pain can be because of gluten insensitivity yeah. so maybe so that's that why is, it gets associated yeah. so that is a totally different thing gluten has a effect for those who are sensitive to it in the gut that it okay. can cause abdominal pain it can cause diarrhea and so on and so forth that is an entirely different entity no effect on the kidney yes effect on the intestine based on sensitivities okay and uh, one more question is not question it sounds like a statement is that covid-19 infection does increase or can cause proteinuria yes there's no doubt about it oh, covid-19 really? infection in fact i have put it up on my slide as well yes covid-19 infection can increase proteinuria can cause proteinuria it can cause hematuria it can cause kidney failure or acute kidney injury especially in patients who are in the icu it can worsen those who have chronic kidney disease it can worsen their creatinine levels and cause acute on chronic ckd so yes uh, covid infection has a lot of effects on the kidney that we are seeing currently Mansi Anekar wants to know: Does exercise increase creatinine and protein urea numbers? Yes, exercise when you do your urine protein level immediately after exercise, and this is something I've put up. Uh, immediately after exercise is not the time to test protein urine protein levels because urine protein levels can go up after exercise. This is physiological and does not mean kidney damage. What was the other part of the question? Uh, just wants to know that uh, does uh, uh, does exercise increase creatinine and protein urea number so exercise can increase protein in the urine and this can happen immediately after exercise so you need to wait for 4 to 6 hours before you test the urine uh, for protein don't do any protein measurements after let us say a long run 
or uh, exercise at the gym don't do urine protein levels not good because your protein levels will be high but that's physiological uh, on the other hand exercise causing kidney this uh, creatinine raise no exercise doesn't increase the creatinine but those who exercise and go to the gym are fond of taking high protein powders if they do that the creatinine can go up okay so i think that's what is uh, the end of our question answer session with you right now quite a long session here yeah. quite a long session and i have to tell you that everybody tonight who has watched this session is definitely going to have chapatis or puri or parathas because everyone is so excited that you have said Mind that you. wheat is going to not affect their Mind protein you. puris yeah. and parathas have more oil so be careful yeah so he said he will allow you to have anything but nothing fried so you want to go and have your chapati or you want to go and have your bread please have it but don't I, have fried things i would again say that your nephrologist is the best person to guide you so if you do have questions you should ask your nephrologist he may have a different he or she may have a different thought process from mine and the difference in thought process doesn't mean that he is wrong or i am right or i am wrong and he or she is right all thought processes come out of our reading of medical literature and that is how we apply our brains to treat patients so please be in touch with your own kidney specialist i am sure they are treating you properly and i am sure that you will benefit the more you listen to your doctor yes but i think because of this entire industry which is thriving on of course weight loss and healthy eating and stuff like that gluten and wheat has always been blamed for a lot of things so it's of course in our heads as well being in this situation of ckd patients or caregivers so i suppose it's a kind of a relief that there's not that much being pressure being hammered down on them lots of remarks sir to say thank you for a brilliant session and i must say that you have been wonderful with us kidney warrior foundation is so blessed and privileged to have you sir and the one thing that sir said in the beginning itself if you are here please remember you are your own health keeper so always keep your labs and all your reports and follow all the discussions that you have with your doctor do not say you are eating a blue pill or a red pill have the names of it know why you are having it and also keep in touch with all kinds of data that's available but in the end you have to get back to your doctor to clarify everything Anjali I have to thank you Mary Ann Mrs Vasundhara Raghavan and the Kidney Warriors Foundation for inviting me to speak here thank you I will also say here on record I am a big fan of Usha Uttar thank you thank It's you it's really so nice thank you. to meet you thank you thank you thank you so much thank you so please remember to keep joining us on the kidney warrior page and of course on the warriors journal because every day in some way we're going to reach out to you to make your life easier and i think as a community we can do things much better remember grief shared is half and happiness shared is double stay home and stay safe and with us always thank you good night thank and you. sleep well thank you sir thank you thank and you. good night good night